we've talked to a number of doctors here this weekend at the Health Freedom yes. Expo, and uh, they have similar stories that you have that we've been able to do this, and mm -hmm. it's been simple because of <clears> this <throat> and this. Yes. What is holding solutions like that back from becoming mainstream therapies? Okay, well, two, two reasons, Scott. Number one, there's insurance. And people say, why should I spend two bucks a day for a treatment that my doctor poo-poos when I can get the treatment he wants me to do for free from insurance? You know, we want that mm -hmm. Canadian free health care. Yes. And so that mentality in the American public has held it back because mm -hmm. the public is not demanding the um, cure, if you will, just from something simple, but it might cost them a third of the cost of a cup of Starbucks coffee. The second thing is the pharmaceutical industry drives things. You see, there's no law requiring doctors to cure people when there's a cure available. There's no law requiring doctors to prevent diseases in people when the prevention is known. Now, if it were my way, if I were the U.S. Surgeon General, the first thing I would do is pass a law. You see, they, as this agency, they could make a law. They don't even need to go to Congress and get it approved. We, they could just make a law. Well, I would make a law by fiat. I would make a law that said that if there's a disease that is curable with a, a, anything, whether it's an herb or a drug or a <clears throat> nutrient, if it's curable and the physician just treated the symptoms as opposed to uh, curing it, there was a cure available, I would put them in jail for a class A felony for 25 years to life. And by the time you did it to the first thousand physicians, the rest of them would start recommending the cure, right? <clears throat> because they wouldn't want to go to jail. But of course, that's not going to happen. Uh, the pharmaceutical and the medical lobby is too powerful, so that's not going to happen. So what has to happen is education. For the last 33 years, this is the 33rd year I've been doing this, Scott, giving free lectures, or 300 free lectures each year. 300 free lectures a year. Okay, to educate people that they do have options. Well, it's only been in the last two years with the financial meltdown, with the medical meltdown, um, that people have begun to say, well, what is this stuff you've been talking about, Wallach? Uh, suddenly now they're interested because if you lose your job, you don't have insurance. Suddenly now what they perceived of as a free treatment isn't free anymore because they have to pay for it out of their own pocket. So now going to a doctor for a $10,000 knee replacement becomes unconscionable for them when they can fix it with a $2 a day nutritional supplement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you, you mentioned under your system, maybe put these doctors mm -hmm. in jail. Yes. Maybe not to that extreme, but the opposite happens where physicians like you or others that we've talked to get, you know, pushed aside, have their licenses taken away, get fired. Or get fired. Fired, yeah. yeah. I mean, so it's, it's kind of happening in, in the reverse order right now still, isn't it? Yes, it's still uh, happening incorrectly because, uh, of course, the pharmaceutical industry and the medical um, monopoly, it's a monopoly, um, is in control. They, they give more money to PAC committees, to legislators, than any other group uh, there is, okay? And the, um, the thing that happens is when you give that much money to legislators, suddenly now these guys are the only guys. Everybody knows that the medical system is the perfect and single worthy system because it's the only system. Now this was known 290 years ago. The first U.S. Surgeon General, a guy by the name of Benjamin Rush, who was an MD, realized that the, the uh, different philosophies of medicine were fighting amongst each other. They were actually having gun fights in the street. Certain groups of medical doctors would take over a hospital and lock the doors, and the other groups of medical doctors would march down to the town armory and get a cannon, blow the door off, and they'd go in and have gunfights because one was homeopaths and the other ones used herbs and the other ones liked physical medicine and stuff. They were literally having gunfights over this. And so Benjamin Rush, who was the top surgeon for the Continental Army during the Revolution, George Washington personally appointed him as the first U.S. Surgeon General. There's a very famous story. He said that he wanted an amendment in the Constitution which said that people would have their choices of medical sciences. He said, if we don't have an amendment in the Constitution giving people their choice, free choice of which medical science they want, like their choice of religion and freedom of speech, mm -hmm. he said, somewhere along the line, and I'm quoting him now, one class of men will take over the medical sciences and it will be the Bastille of America. Now his fears have become our nightmare 290 years later because the free enterprise system has never taken place in the medical industry since the American Medical Association was formed. Everything they've done for the last 100 years was not to learn how to treat 
patients better. Everything they've done for the last hundred years has been designed to kill off all competition and make them the sole source of medical knowledge, the ones, the chosen ones, right? That was their goal, and they've become successful. And so the only way this is going to become undone is if people stop using this failed and corrupt system we know as our medical system. Right now, the average lifespan of Americans makes us 46th in the world in longevity. There's 45 other countries whose peoples live longer than us. We're 92nd in healthfulness. And we spend more money for health care than all the other 218 nations the world put together. So their system is a failed and it's a corrupt system. And so again, the people are going to have to rise up here and choose to do things themselves. And then the medical system becomes unfunded. If nobody's using it, how can you justify funding them? And so this is how it's going to have to happen. Because the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industry is so powerful. And they form what I call the unholy trilogy with the government, I'm talking about city, county, state, federal government, uh, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the medical system have formed this unholy trilogy. And they, according to the Center for Disease Control and their own journal, the Journal of American Medical Association, four and a half years ago, it was February 7th, 2007, uh, they came out and said that um, these two agencies, the Journal of American Medical Association, the Center for Disease Control, the federal agency that tracks these things, that medical doctors kill, injure, and infect 15 million of their patients every year in American hospitals and their private offices, 5.8 million in hospitals and 9.2 million in private offices. They kill, injure, and infect 15 million. They don't even get an OSHA ticket. They get a walk. Now, what if cab drivers were to do that? Everybody said, my gosh, I'm going to walk. Well, Roy, it's 50 miles to the airport. I'll just leave three days early, but I'm walking. I ain't getting in a cab. <laughs> But yet people still line up to get this very dangerous, very ineffective. I mean, we, we rank 46th in the world longevity and 92nd in healthfulness. The recipe is not a good recipe, Scott. Mm -hmm.